VoiceOver Coffee Shop, episode number 52. Welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop, where we share our morning with some of the finest names in VoiceOver. And now, here's your host, voice actor Andrew Morrison. Hi there, my name is Andrew Morrison, and welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop, where we start our day with some of the finest names in VoiceOver. If you'd like to know a little bit more about me, feel free to visit my website at www.andrewdmorrison.com. In this episode, we have the legendary man himself, Jeff Howell. Coach, demo producer, and VP of Productions at Worldwide Radio, Jeff has produced commercials and promos for hundreds of the largest companies on the planet. In this episode, we talk about the differences between agency and casting director selections, how casting directors stay relevant, and understanding the promo read. So how are you doing today, Jeff? Great. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. So how do you take your coffee in the morning? <laughs> black i can't do dairy anymore i i used to love my lattes and all that i mean i could do the oat milk or coconut milk or whatever but i actually like black coffee so okay yeah <laughs> black coffee is a great way to start the day so <laughs> you you started in this industry as an agent and i mean i know you've done that to casting director to uh, vp of operations at worldwide radio mm -hmm. and now you're working out of a lot of studios in la how did you get wrapped up into the creative industry well, you know, to kind of put it in a nutshell, you know, I, I just, you know, growing up, I was really, I found myself being drawn towards the creative field of acting. And I was in theater and did a little bit of acting myself, which I think helps me in terms of being able to relate to actors from a directorial standpoint. But I also realized I did not want to be an actor myself because I didn't feel like I really had that <laughs> gift. I so respect what all the actors do out there because I know how difficult it is. So anyway, but then, uh, you know, high school, college, and in college, I, I went to Boston U and I was in their communications department and worked in radio and television and really enjoyed the production part of that. And, and so then I worked at a PR agency in Boston. And then finally, I decided I was going to move to New York and work in New York. So I applied for a couple of jobs in New York. I had an inside uh, sort of um, contact at CBS. And so I went and had an interview, several interviews with them. But they had a hiring freeze at the time. And then I thought, you know what? While I'm free, why not move out to L.A. and check that out? Because one of my instructors had said, you know, if you really want to be in production, you got to be in L.A. So... I just uh, moved out here and never looked back and uh, you know, just started and just trying to find any kind of job I could get. And just through a contact, I ended up doing extras casting for a couple of years, worked on a bunch of shows, movies. And even though I didn't really like that work, it was a great way to get on sets and start getting to know the industry and all that. And then the, the company I was working for went out of business. And so I started temping at various talent agencies. And I think the fourth or fifth one I temped at uh, was at Abram Jubiloff and Lawrence, which had a very big voiceover department. And so I uh, just fell in love with voiceover. And I thought this is really a natural fit for me because I had some background in radio and television and advertising and PR. And, and plus I had directed theater. And so I just really just loved it, just loved it. And, uh, and I never looked back. Like I said, it's just been a great ride. And that's what drew me to the creative field of voiceover. And I, and I really am so thankful that it found me and I found voiceover because, you know, I, not that I don't like on camera and I'm sure probably had I chosen on camera, I would have enjoyed it hopefully as much as I enjoy voiceover, voiceover, though I doubt it. But I just think that for me, I have such respect for voice talent and the, the craft of voiceover. And I, I know what it takes to uh, give a good performance, whether it's in the commercial area or promo or narration or animation and now dubbing. And the people that are just uh, involved in this entire field, like, you know, when we see in these co conventions and things, I just, again, I have such respect for these folks that really are trying to get into it, you know? So anyway, that's that. So I just, I, I love it. I love it. And I guess that answered your question. I am uh, yeah. <laughs> drawn, drawn into it. And again, I, I just love every second of it. And I love training actors. And when I have time, I'll do a demo or two, but I'm not really in the demo business, but but I, I love working with talent. When you made that jump from from being an agent to casting, those are those are both jobs that that involve like a lot of selection and and a fine ear in order to do that. What what were the differences in that selection process when you were changing over? Because I don't know, 
a lot on the agency side or on the casting side. So like, how did that kind of change your day to day? Stop. Yeah. Well, what happened was, you know, I think that being, sorry, my, my texts are going off like crazy here. Sorry about that. Right. Uh, the, uh, the difference between being an agent and in casting is that when you're an, when you're an agent, you only have a sort of a, a finite sort of group of people to choose from. And you can passionately be uh, attached to those people and, and want to get them work and you know, all their specialties and what they can do. But when you're in casting, you have an unlimited amount of people that you can work with and you know and, and I think another key uh, sort of difference between casting and being an agent is that when you're an agent you're selling and when you're casting you're buying and I love buying I love uh, being able to award uh, ta talent with jobs uh, I think being an, an agent was frustrating because I knew how good my my actors were but I you know you can only do so much you know you can't force the buyers to buy your talent you can certainly expose them to it and try to convince them that you've got the best talent, but you know you just don't have that sort of power or that control. Whereas when you're a casting director, you really have a full palette of people to choose from. So depending on your project, you can you know finally hone in on on exactly what you want, or you can experiment and just open the casting up to everyone and and try something new. You know, so it's. Yeah. I think, you know, again, the key difference, I think, answering your question is that, you know, it's buyer seller and also having uh, more, you know, when you're an agent, more limited supply. And then when you're casting an unlimited supply. Gotcha. And I've, and I've taken a lot of coaching as a talent, but what do casting directors do on a daily basis to kind of make themselves better casting directors and make themselves better at their jobs? Are there like any, mm -hmm. any, any like, Cat coaching for casting directors or like what like what is that process of of getting better in that position well i can only speak for myself right, and, right. yeah and and you know i to be honest with you you know i don't cast as much as i used to mm -hmm. uh when i was working at Burt Burtison company in the commercial division there i was in charge of their casting department there and then produced and directed as well but we were casting i was casting every day and multiple projects every day and so you know i I think I just stayed sharp because I just kept doing it and, and being involved in the industry and getting to know talent and going to theater and talking to agents and listening to agents. I mean, I, I tried to be a, a, a casting director that was more open to taking the agent's suggestions. And if I felt that they were off, I would let the agents know and say, hey, the person you recommended wasn't quite right. And I'll tell you why. I mean, I wasn't being a jerk about it. I was just giving them feedback that they needed to hear. Um, so, you know, I think that that you know, just from an overall perspective, though, to answer your question about what what casting people can do to stay relevant, I think it's just by, you know, I think staying contemporary and knowing what the trends are out there, number one, in terms of whatever, what area they're casting in, whether it's commercial or whether it's promo, narration, animation, all that, you need to know the players and, and educate yourself and also be open to new people. And then also you want to go out and try your best to spend some time seeking out new people and listening to new people out there, maybe people that aren't necessarily as entrenched in the voiceover industry as the ones that we have submitted to us by agents all the time, you know, going to theater, maybe there's an actor that not necessarily has a voiceover agent, but yet they seem to have a really good uh, sort of acting ability and they vocally seem to be acting in their performances and maybe something dynamic that you might need and make a reference for, you know, in terms of what you need. And in the dubbing world, that actually is very important for me. Mm -hmm. is to seek out really good actors, not necessarily ones that are used to being behind a microphone, you know? So, right. so I guess, but to answer your question, I think it's just self-education for a casting director, just trying to stay on top of the trends and, and try not to just rest on uh, the tried and true. Now I, I know human nature being what it is, we all get busy. Sometimes we're crazy busy as a casting person. Sometimes we're just going to fall default back into our list of people and the agents that we call and the list of actors we like to see, the ones that hit a home run every time. Of course, that's going to happen because if we get really cra crazed, we may not have the bandwidth to be able to be um, as creative, as uh, loose, and as um, thinking outside the box, let's say, as we would ordinarily. So anyway, I think hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. So um, speaking of like bringing in like greener talent and stuff like that, whenever you're coaching people, how, how are you, what are you doing to like arm them for when they are approaching casting directors who do want to be creative and get like a little outside of the box and look for somebody new? How are you, how are you arming your students? I would say. Everybody coaches a little differently. So I'm just curious what. 
You're exactly. Better. And and I think everyone has their sort of go-to technique. And I think that for me, number one, I try to uh, build up the confidence of the actors because, you know, you can't control what's going on out there. And every casting session is different. Uh, the needs of whatever is being cast are different. So I think that, you know, I think that by guiding the student along and first of all, hopefully giving them some basics and fundamentals of voiceover and just some voiceover technique is important for any instructor out there to to give to their students. And, you know, it's all the the basics that we all know, the analysis, script analysis and and you know, all the all the all that stuff, you know. But I think that in addition to that is to I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm almost a therapist to some actors when they're, you know, and, and understandably, it's a crazy yeah. business and, you know, it's fraught with all kinds of, you know, negative things that could potentially happen. Um, but I try to give them some insight, number one, about, you know, we are all very self-critical usually. And so I, you know, in the, the proverbial sort of, why didn't I book that job? What did I do wrong? And what happened? And I thought it was great and it wasn't. And why aren't they choosing me and all that? But But I try to give them a dose of reality of knowing, letting them know and reinforcing the idea of what happens. Once they audition, there's all kinds of factors that can come into play that can determine whether or not they even are potentially bookable for that job. For example, sometimes the, the ethnicity could change. Mm -hmm. uh, the sex could, the gender, the sex could change. You know, the copy could change dramatically. The job got canceled or the job went to the, the nephew of the ad agency exec. You know, you just never know. There are all kinds of factors. So I try to tell actors all the time that, yes, of course, it's human nature to so, do self-analysis and to wonder, okay, what am I doing wrong? Why am I not booking and all that? But just to know that there are a lot of factors that come into play in terms of whether or not you book a job. And as long as you're out there and you approach these jobs with confidence and with knowledge and, and some fundamental understanding of VO, and also try to just make sure you're sharp every time you open your mouth and read a piece of copy, whether it's in front of a casting person or whether it's at home, which is more often not these days, um, you've got to be sharp. And that's why the self-study comes into play, working out a couple of times a week behind your microphone, uh, making sure you have a great understanding of your gear so that you don't panic if you're all of a sudden having to send an MP3 file and you've forgotten how to do it or your computer's acting up. You know, it's, it's arming actors with information so that they're confident in when they step behind a microphone alone in their booths at home and having to sit there and be their own director and having to self-analyze, I think it's important to at least try to help actors by building up their confidence, showing them what can happen in the industry just in general as to why or not they're booking and just hope that they're training, you know? Yeah. So what 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 kinds of coaching do you do? It seems like every time I'm looking at Jeff Howe related to a class, it's always promo related. Mm -hmm. So like, do do you consider yourself a, a specifically a, a promo coach or like what? For the conferences, that's that's an interesting question. For the conferences, yes, I'm primarily a promo coach because I was in the promo business and still am, but I'm right. not as much now because the promo business has changed and shifted quite a bit. So, you know, I was working at Worldwide Radio for 17 years, VP of production there, and we worked with so many networks. I mean, I was, in fact, yesterday I was doing a private coaching with someone and I was trying to describe to them what it was like during those times. And we were so busy that I literally was going uh, on some days I would have a clipboard and I'd be going from edit bay to edit bay and directing. It was like, I felt like a doctor going in and, examining <laughs> patient. and I'd get the read in like 10 seconds practically sometimes. Cause you know, most of the people we work with were such, so skilled like Joe Cipriano and Don LaFontaine and all these people, they didn't require that much direction from me as, other than guiding them along long and making sure the times worked and, you know, hitting certain words here and there. But for the most part, these were people who had these accounts and knew their, their brand and knew the network and all that. And, and so it was relatively an easy record. And so I would go in and zip, make sure everything was okay. And I'd leave and go in the next set of day and be directing someone else and make sure the producer was okay. And that really, really sharpened my skills in terms of promo and understanding what's involved. And even though certainly between those days and now there's been, um, a change in terms of the taste and the style. But that being said, uh, I still know that read intimately and what it takes to get it. And so that's why I'm sought after because there are not as many people that are expert in promo out there. Right. 
Uh, and so it makes me sort of one of those people that uh, is seen as a sort of an old timer and an expert. But I've also directed narration. And so I've taught narration. Uh, Tom Pinto is also wonderful at teaching narration. Uh, commercial. I did commercial for many years, but I certainly will stand back. And I, I certainly applaud Mary Lynn Wissner. She's amazing at commercial. So I, I don't even touch commercial these days unless someone wants to coach privately with me. And I'll, I'll help them analyze copy and do that. But you know, Mary Lynn certainly excels in that. And animation. I've directed animation before. I've certainly done my, my share of casting. I've helped actors through breaking down animation scripts and characters and helping them through choices and through auditions. But I step back from animation classes and that sort of thing because there's so many wonderful people out there. And like for promo, these people have been in animation and that's been their lives for many years. So I would rather that they, those are the experts. And I would rather send people which I've done to those people to train in animation because they have the tricks and they have all the experiences, many years of experience by the microphone and teaching. So I'd rather default to them. And then dubbing, of course, now I've been teaching quite a bit more dubbing because that's my life primarily these days. And, uh, and I feel that I've certainly learned quite a bit of the tricks in terms of, of uh, what you guys go through in terms of trying to uh, give a, a, uh, well-performed sort of uh, performance. So I do dubbing, but primarily I'm known as promo and I'd say secondary now dubbing is becoming more of my specialty as well. So how has promo changed? You, you had mentioned in, as far as like taste and read, like promos changed since you, you were getting started in promo. In, in what ways have you seen the promo industry change? Are you there? Yeah, okay. I'm here. Sorry. Little, sorry. So yes, promo has changed. The, the taste has changed a bit. Um, I'd say it's not as, as people in my classes have heard me say this a million times, it's not as bombastic as it used to be. Okay. Um, you know, when I first got into promo, uh, and, and again, these were because a lot of our accounts were these big voice accounts, whereas, you know, like, for example, directing Don LaFontaine on Survivor spots for CBS, and he was, you know, CBS Survivor, you know, and, the, right. and it's that, that, that added hit. Um, the, yeah, the growl. And, and certainly... Um, you know, directing uh, Major League Baseball, Fox Sports. And we had some wonderful announcers that we hired for that. And and the the delivery used to be, the direction I would give would be right up to the level of Monster Truck, but not going into Monster Truck. And for those that know, you know, Monster Truck was that very aggressive and, you know. So the taste has changed in that it's backed off a little bit. It's more conversational. And I actually was watching MTV the other night just to study some of the promos. And there was a female... Uh, it was delivering a promo for, I think it was Jersey Shore. Uh, there's there's a show coming, another show coming up, another version of it. And uh, I thought the delivery was interesting because I closed my eyes. It came on a couple of times. So when it would come on, I would close my eyes and listen to it. And it was definitely not as projected into the microphone. In fact, I thought the mix was maybe a little light. I would have probably, if I had been uh, mixing it myself, I probably would have brought the voice a little bit more forward. But even so, the read was engaging, but it was not aggressive. So she had some play in the verbiage. She certainly turned the phrases to entice the audience, but it was not aggressive at all. And so I think the key difference that I'm noticing more and more and more is that promos have sort of fallen into the same trap that commercials did years ago, where all of a sudden the taste is, de the demands out there are more quote unquote conversational than the typical sort of announcer, big announce sort of delivery. And you you are wearing so many hats. How do you find time for a personal life? What does like your daily schedule even look like? <laughs> yeah, well, it depends on what project I'm on. So right now I'm in a a, a bit of a lull, which is good because I'm actually here at my office at LA Studios right now, and I'm cleaning and filing and doing all the things I just haven't been able to do. So it's been great. So, but yeah, personal life, you know, it just comes and goes in terms of my ability to just maneuver through these, uh, you know, taking care of myself during these big projects, but I still make time for myself. Don't get me wrong. In the weekends, I certainly cut loose and, you know, go hiking and see friends and travel as best as I, much as I can and all that. So yeah. What, what, what other hobbies do you have? What else do you do to recharge outside of the office? Well, I think it's, you know, I, I have a kind of a side business in that I, I work loosely work at a boxing gym down the street and I've been boxing for about 12, 13, 14 years now. And, um, and I love it. It's an addiction, you know, it's great physical activity. 
Uh, I don't spar as much anymore because it's just not good. You know, you get hit and, you know, that there you go. And when you're, when you get up there in age, you know, one little jolt and you're all of a sudden you're in traction, but, but I love the sport of it and I love the exercise of it. And it's a great sort of fraternity of guys that work out at the gym that I've gotten to know over the years. So that's partly one of my biggest hobbies. And that's where I go practically every morning. And then, um, uh, then, you know, on the weekends, I'll do that too. I hike, I love hiking. And then, you know, I just visit with friends, play games. I love playing games. I'll have people over and we'll play cards and, and do all that. And, and, you know, when I have a chance, I like to read, but I just I have several, a stack of books by my bed that I want to read, but I get in bed and I'm so comfortable. All of a sudden I'm falling asleep, you know, yeah. or I'm pushing up on Netflix. You know, I, how, I don't know about you and those of you listening out there, but the thing is, you know, all these streaming services and everyone recommends these shows. And I'm like, oh, I want to watch that. I want to watch that. Right. And then the, you know, I like to keep up with what's going on in the dubbing world. So I try to watch what my friends are directing out there and what friends are appearing in. They'll say, oh, I just finished such and such. I want you to watch it. And so, you know, when you try to do all that and all of a sudden there's no time for anything else. So so in terms of hobbies and stuff, that's about all I can fit in at this point. But, um, but that all keeps me busy. Gotcha. So if you were to write yourself a letter from where you're sitting now and send it back to when you had just got it started as an agent, what, what would you tell your past self? I would say, that's a good question. I would say, um, save your money. <laughs> 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 travel more. Uh, even though I do travel quite a bit, but I, I just love traveling. So I'd say travel more. Um, and I don't know. There's not much, you know, in quite, all honesty, there's not much I would really change in terms of, I've been very happy with the trajectory of my career. I mean, there've been some uh, sort of curveballs thrown at me, just like with everyone, you know, but it's all in how you respond to those. And, and, and I've been very fortunate. I must say, I have certainly had some good fortune, uh, but I've also worked very hard for it too, you know, and I continue to work hard because I, you know, it's easy to work hard in something that you love. You know, and, and you know, I, I, you know, I know people that have had or they're in jobs that they just can't stand. And I, I understand it's life. And, you know, we get set into these, you know, routines and paths that it's not going to be so glib to say, just change it and move on. You know, that's very difficult to do due to your life circumstances. But, you know, if you are lucky enough to be in something that you truly love, I think that it, the work, I mean, it's, it's exhausting. Don't get me wrong. And there's days where I just go, oh. I need a vacation, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> but, but I look forward to every day. I really do. And, and, uh, you know, if I'm really crazy busy, you know, certain days I, I wake up and I am stressed because I know of how much I have to do and what I have to accomplish and the task that I have ahead of me. But then at the end of the day, it feels so good when it's done. And, and I just look forward to the next day. And as long as I can stay current and, and, uh, relevant, that's the most important thing. And I guess maybe back to your question about writing a letter to myself um, as an agent or even before that period of time, it would be to try your best to stay ahead of the trends and stay current, read as much as you can, study about what's going on in the industry, especially ours, which is so dependent on pop culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's important. And I know I'm not the best at it. I mean, there, you know, it's because it's just moving so quickly. There's only so much our brains can absorb, you know, and how much time we have at hand because we have to function. We can't just sit there and read from morning till night and watch programming from morning till night, you know. Right. And so, uh, but I, I think that, yeah, that too, I would probably add in that letter as well is to try to stay relevant ahead of it as much as possible. Gotcha. And if somebody wants to book you for coaching or get to know you a little bit better, where can they find you? Uh, probably the best way to do it is to email me. And my email address is Jeff, J E F F, at Jeff Howell, V O dot com. And so, and I always say this to everyone <laughs> that if you do not hear back from me right away, feel free to send me another reminder to, so it'll go to the top of my box. I do try to spend time emptying that inbox, but it's just I get hit on I mean, right now. I've been doing that actually the last couple of days I've been trying to really go through and I've found a couple of things that I'm embarrassed to say got passed to me. But you know, when you're in session, you can't just sit there and check emails all day. Right. And then what happens too, and I tell people all the time that I'll see something and I'll read it and I'll go, Oh, I, I want to get to that. And then I'll think I'm going to get back to it. And then it layers and layers on top. And it's marked as, uh, as red. 
And sometimes it gets, it falls into the cracks. So I'd say, you know, I definitely will try to respond my as quickly as possible to any email that I receive. But if you don't hear from me, don't take it personally. And it's not an ego thing. It's more a, a disorganization, it's organization thing on my part. Um, but, um, but just be persistent because I would love to work with new people. All the, I mean, I love working with new people all the time. So fantastic. Thanks for coming on, Jeff. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I really hope you enjoyed listening to Jeff's journey through the ever-changing world of advertisement and how his many different positions in the industry have brought him to touch so many amazing pieces of voiceover magic. If you'd like to get to know more about Jeff or book him for demos or coaching, you can visit him at www.jeffhowellvo.com. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The VoiceOver Coffee Shop. For more information on guests, new episodes, and more, be sure to visit www.vocoffeeshop.com.